Hello, this is the first session of a new closure group. We call it Data We Care, and this name is the result of, of a nice discussion we had with uh, Paul, who is here today with us, and with our friend Marshall. And the idea of Data We Care is to have monthly meetings where we could discuss our collaborations on data libraries in Clojure. So it is mostly a developer group. It is about developer, uh, de de developer needs. It, it is about sharing updates and exploring ideas and also encouraging people who like to become contributors or just could provide a feedback to existing projects. And it, it is, uh, you know, all, all this project is very much affected by a conversation uh, uh, that Bruce and I had uh, a few weeks ago. And so I'm so happy that Bruce is here today. And um, uh, I think uh, we will have a few topics today, all of them like small, and it will be a new beginning of new things um, about what we wish to make of it. So maybe I'll share the screen for a moment with the agenda. And uh, you see, uh, we uh, will have uh, like the, the official part will be about 90 minutes and we'll have some very brief intros of ourselves. And then Paul will uh, have an, an intro to closure walk, uh, with walking a tree of data with a real world problem. And then we'll have some updates about some of the community groups we are organizing these days and maybe we think about them together about for example about the our plans for the data science course for closure developers and then maybe if time permits we'll talk about closure apis and what could make them easier and how we could learn from r and if we could look into some examples in the r language and we conclude by thinking about this group and the hopes uh, of it and yeah so um uh, if it is okay, then maybe Paul, you would like to share the screen. And, uh, is it good? Oh yeah, sorry, I, I forgot. Yeah, we should introduce ourselves. Uh, so if it is okay, then uh, each one of us will tell a bit about themselves, and then they will pick another one to tell something. Just a bit, you know, what you're interested in, your background, whatever you like to tell. So Paul, maybe you will begin and then pick another one. Uh, hey, I'm a developer. I mostly done front end stuff, uh, and I, I think the cl closest thing to data science that I've gotten into is with constraint solving. So, I've worked a lot with different types of constraint solvers, like Choco, which is a Java one that's pretty well maintained, and um, Something called IBEX, which is like an engineering focus constraint solver. Uh, so I've been in closure for, I guess, like 10 years or so. So fun to play around with. I played around with tablecloth a little bit, but I'm sort of just starting with, with data science stuff. Um, so I guess uh, Daniel can go next. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I'm Daniel. I do statistics mostly. I am part of a, a, a small team of data science people who mostly use other languages, not closure. And uh, I'm involved in this Cyclops community, uh, building some closure libraries. Um, and George? Hello, I'm George. I'm in the uh, United States on the East Coast. And um, I work for a financial institution. I built some APIs in Clojure several years ago, um, but I haven't been able to use it since and I've missed it. And um, now I'm switching jobs next week to data engineering where they use Scala and Python. And I thought, man, you know, I really want to get back into Clojure. So I'm hoping to learn about the data science part, even though I'm not a data scientist, data engineering, 
but um, and but I especially miss closure. So I'm excited just to get back into hopefully learning some closure and then hopefully learning a little bit about the data science libraries associated with it. Uh, I will go with Jacob. Hi, um, I'm a kind of jack of all trades at uh, USC here on the West Coast in the US. Um, so I, I picked up Closure years ago to do data processing, mostly in their HR and uh, contracts. And I'm just really impressed with tablecloth, the APIs, and want to learn more. And I noticed um, the Bayesian thing is picking up speed. So I'm curious about what's happening there and um, where I might fit in and participate. So it's nice to see you all. I need to pick the last person, <laughs> sorry. Uh, my son was interrupting me. So I know uh, George spoke and Paul spoke. We have um, someone just joining and Bruce is, uh, is that OT from? Yeah, out from, yeah. Out from, okay. <laughs> so whoever's left, there's so few of us. I, 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 I can go. Um, so I'm Bruce. Uh, I've been doing Clojure for about ooh, 12 years now, I think. Um, I use Tablecloth and TechML data set quite a lot. Um, my career has mostly been in data engineering, and I'm pretending to be a data scientist at the moment. Um, luckily, I'm pretty good at sort of looking at graphs and understanding business problems and telling people what to do, but it's the, the maths that I need to get better at, really. So. Uh, that's sort of what I'm hoping to be able to get long term out of the data science community is sort of trying to learn maths via code rather than learn maths in and of itself. So uh, I think that's me. And uh, so we've got our, our new starter. So is that Richie? Hi, yeah. Um, hi everybody. Um, sorry late. I was having a meeting. Um, uh, so I'm Richie. Richie Sai. I uh, my background is uh, uh, well. I pick up closure. I think nine years ago uh, before I start my PhD program, and then throughout the thing, I've been you know just, it's become my my main developer tool. And then at the end, I you know, um, I developed with, with help of great help of closure. Um, I, you know, developed my PhD dissertation. Um, um, and then at this point, um, I'm working on the visa as a closure developer. And yeah, so I, I'm actually, um, you know, I'm just, just, I'm just trying to join this meetings, just meet some new people, see how everybody else, you know, uh, using it, share experience, because um, all oh, throughout my my you know past uh, maybe nine eight years, just I I don't know anybody use closure or Lisp around me. So I'm pretty much just you know learn things on my own and uh, you know pick up things from the internet, obviously. Um, so you know I just I'm, I just you know I'm excited to to meet some new people here. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to meet you again, Richie, and thanks everybody. Um, what I'll share now in the Zoom chat is a link to the relevant uh, topic thread at the Zulip chat. Zulip chat is the place where most of us discuss data science uh, developments and user problems, and it is a recommended space to be at if you are about data science and closure. So here is a link where we could have a chat in this meeting. So, you know, we could then have it uh, remaining with us. And if anybody has a problem with connecting to Zulip, uh, then let us talk afterwards and uh, I'll help you, help you. And we will begin this meeting with uh, the demo by Paul uh, about closure walk. And Paul, uh, we have time, so uh, it could be short. It could be longer as much as you find useful. And yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I I don't think it'll be too long. Uh, so let's just share. 
Steve Needham, right? Oh, whatever. Um, okay. So, uh, unfortunately, my hard drive sort of crashed a day or two ago. So I'm just, I had like some really nice real world examples <laughs> where I was uh, doing some really fancy work with a bunch of JSON files. But yeah. now yeah. I just have, uh, I just have the very <laughs> nasty one, which is the schema. So. Uh, Paul, could we make the font bigger, maybe? Much yes. bigger, if you could. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I when I um, focus on a piece of data, I'll, I'll make it bigger. So this, uh, actually, I'll show off what the walk namespace looks like. It's not very big. It's, it's stable. It's only 130 lines of code. Um, a lot of these functions are not really common, like keywordize keys and stringify keys, you probably never need to use. Macro expand all also you probably never will use, or like very, very niche scenario will you use it. The the rest, uh, actually these two place, uh, they are, mirrors of an existing function called replace, which I I never see used. However, I will show you examples of where these two walk replaces are, are very nice. Um, uh, and uh, Paul, Paul, is it true that closure.walk is part of the closure standard library? So yes, you don't need to include any dependencies for this. Uh, you just reference the namespace, closure walk, it comes with closure. So um, also the main function here, you never use, you only really ever use post, these two functions, post walk and pre walk. So in this respect, library is a little strange. Uh, you definitely can use walk. I have never seen it used other than to like build post walk and pre walk. And the most important thing, the most important function when you start using this library is the demo functions. And I'll show you what those mean. Without the demo functions, you will be very lost. Uh, because the, you, you'll probably not have you don't really have much context when you're dealing with walking, um, which is a little different when you're dealing with map or iterating over a list. Like when you're, iter when you're iterating over a list, you have a, a pretty good idea of what the next thing you're gonna see is. And like everything in your list is the same typically, or it's, it's similar in some way that matters. But when you're walking over a tree, like every single thing your function sees is different at every step. Uh, and that, and being able to, to use walk efficiently is really just a matter of sort of knowing that concept and just writing like a, a few if statements to deal with every thing you think you're going to encounter. Uh, so I'll now show you what the pre-walking and uh, no, the walk demos look like. Oh my God, <laughs> this, my Emacs setup is uh, totally different from what I'm used to. So I'm like screwing up the key bindings. Okay, so, um, I'll show you the example I'm going to deal with later. This is where walking comes in really handy. It's just when you have nasty looking data. Although there's a lot of times where walking over small pieces of data is really useful, such as like macros. So uh, this is what pre-walk does. So here we can see every step 
that you're, if you were to write a function for pre-walk, this is, this is what the function would see at every step. So it would start with the whole structure and then it'll iterate over each entry. Well, it, it'll iterate over each entry, but as it iterates over each entry, it will delve deeper into this entry. Uh, this uh, pre-walking is a bit uncommon, uh, mainly because one thing you're doing when you're walking is you're changing your tree. You're changing it as you walk. So with pre-walking, you would be changing the tree as you walk down it. And you have to be a bit careful about how you change your tree so that you don't end up making parts of the tree that make duplicate, but like, uh, you have to, you have to avoid the nodes you add looking like the thing your walking function is going to care about so that you don't get some infinite data structure being made. Uh, post walking, you don't really have that problem. So post walking is basically the opposite of walking, uh, pre walking. So you're walking your leaves first, and then your last your your root node is the last thing that you walk. And typically, when you're doing a post walk you care a lot about the leaf. So when you encounter a certain leaf that looks a certain way, you change it. And then um, your code sort of ignores the, the parents, right? So if I was writing code, maybe my code would look for this. Maybe it would look for this key. And then I would change this key or the, the value based on the key. And this key would have a property where it wouldn't be the same as the parent. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't want a structure where you had something like this. Because then that makes it very difficult to, to care about uh, the leaf or differentiate the leaf. You have to write, you have to just write more code in order to figure out if you're on, if you're looking at the thing you want to change, because like, uh, the map structure just looks too self-similar. Like if every single key in the map is the exact same, uh, you can't easily do stuff when you're looking just at the keys. Uh, there's also another issue with, with mapping that's not really common when you're dealing with other closure code. Uh, in this line on line four, this is a vector that represents this, this node in the key. It's the same thing you get when you map over uh, a map. Like if I was to, to map over this, this map. And uh, this is not just a vector. It's, it's also something something different and actually I will show you exactly what all these types are and the types are very important when walking. So this is the same structure and what I what I did is I I wrote a basic walk function where I just print out the type and then what made the type and then I return um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this later. So I'm just, I'm just doing pretty much what walk demo does, except I'm also printing out the type of every node. So, uh, nothing special for a lot of these, uh, these types should be types you're familiar with. This is probably something that's less familiar to people who are used to doing work in closure. This map entry is a, is a special type that also is a vector. 
So you can test for map entry with this function. And I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, so a vector, a vector on its own is not a map entry. But if you do something like first of a map, you get a map entry. Uh, so if you want to do something on a map entry when you're walking, you have to you have to test if your current node, which uh, I always refer to as form, if your current node is a map entry. Uh, I'll show you examples. I'll show you an example of of that. Um, so we can examine the the post walk function. I take in a form. My form is um, all of these, or basically what you get in what you get in your walk or a walk demo. So the walk demo is a really good reference because this is how you're going to construct your your transformation function. Um, and then when you get the form you want, so I can we can say that we're only looking for map entries, and on every map entry, I'm just going to change it in some way, and a way that would make sense to change would be just making, I can just make the string, uh, the key strings. Uh, also on a map entry, you can do key and vowel, which are sort of like how you, how closure destructures map entries when you're doing destructuring. Uh, this key and vowel are pretty much the same as first and, and second. So this is sort of what walking functions should look like. A con statement with the things you're matching on map entry has to be at the very top uh, because if you're matching on a vector or sequential or something those also are uh, map entries are also vectors and you don't you don't want to be transforming a vec a map entry when you're actually trying to match on a vector so uh, in this case ooh, we get an error uh conch pair okay so this is a really basic transform i turned every map entry key into a string uh, so if I put some other keys in other places, they shouldn't change. Yeah. So not that's not too special, but sort of like example of a very, very basic walk function. Uh, So one of the nice things about walk functions is that they work on they work on your macro forms too. So uh, this is an example of pre-walk replace, which basically will look at every form. And if a form matches, it will replace it with uh, the map lookup. So a form can be uh, this is like one idiom, you have a placeholder, and then like your user gives you the thing you want to replace. Uh, 
and basically like this is a Mali map and I have some some weird structure where or a weird template where I have a map that has some standard keys but actually the the data in these keys is dependent on what the user wants so maybe it's a bunch of ints maybe it's a bunch of strings or whatever but the idea is that the user gives me this uh, Tom, uh, could you mention what Mali is? A Mali map? Uh, Mali yeah. is a schema a library in Clojure. So the schemas look like structures like this. This schema uh, represents a map that has like key one and then a bunch of ints. So it has the map has keys that look like this. The key names have to be these exact names. And then the key values are uh, a vector. And in this case, it's a vector of something. So um, the idea here is uh, we have self-documenting code. And instead of us building this map, the structure procedurally with like, iterating over every key and then doing like apply vector something with this placeholder being filled in uh all of our code is is declarative so this is a a bit of a contrived example but this is something i use when i make macros where i sort of want my macro to be a, a template um and I don't want to do a lot of complicated code in my macro to like replace stuff with some user given user given thing. Uh, but to be honest, this replacing stuff, this walk replace idea is a bit uncommon. But when I find uses for it, they they sort of look like this. I just make some something that's a placeholder and then I replace it. So this is an example of what you get. So that can be quite useful when you, you want your code to be self-documenting. Um, but then again, but again, there's not too many places where this does come in useful. I find it, I found it fairly useful when I do macros or something like seeding data. So these are these are all contrived examples. They're not really real world. So let's try to deal with something that's real world. Uh, this is a sch schema that is a JSON schema. I converted it to a closure data structure just by removing semicolons or no colons. Um, so this is this is from Sentry.io. This is the schema that they use to validate payloads that you give to it. Sentry.io is an error reporting tool. It's, uh, could we zoom in just a little bit? Yeah. Thanks. This stuff is like this is overwhelming. So what I'll show what I'll show you guys is how to how to deal with with stuff that's just too overwhelming where you don't really know the structure and you don't care about the structure too much maybe you want to learn a little bit about the the structure or the the piece of data let me get rid of this so uh this is where walking comes in really handy um, because actually trying to figure out how to delve into this data structure is just going to take a lot of time. And um, there are parts of the data structure that are recursive uh, or they're just unnecessarily nested. I'll give you an example. Like this is a particularly nasty part of the data structure. 
Uh, and the way that you would deal with a data structure like this is you're likely not going to be destructuring it. And if you were to try to destructure it, it would just be a real pain in the ass if once you get to this part. And there's not a lot of interesting things that are happening here. If you just want to learn about the data structure in a in a big way, like you don't you don't care about the nitty gritty details right away. So like you don't care about like this this data structure is basically describing that it just does it just validates almost anything you give it, uh, which is pretty useless knowledge. Other than that very high level of knowledge, it's like sort of useless to to know about that. But one thing you probably do want to know is the description. The description of each object will have it's potentially going to have a lot more value than trying to find out anything about the other parts or maybe the type. Although in JavaScript, the types are pretty weak, so you probably don't care about the types, but there could be something to learn about this type because there may be, maybe in the schema, the types aren't just string and like nothing. Maybe there's some types that are, that are different and we want to know about that. For the descriptions, if we're going to be using this schema, maybe uh, in, actually in the case of Sentry IO, the website for the documentation is a bit weak. So maybe we can extract the documentation from the schema itself and have an easier way of, of dealing with the documentation. In, in my case, I've actually used the schema to document my own code where I make a function and then I, I dig into the schema and I, uh, I do something like uh, doc, and then I have a function like get get doc from like century schema, uh, and then I'll have like the thing I want to doc. So in this case, it'd be like query string. So I have a function that sort of does does this and makes makes my own function documented based off of the actual schema, which is pretty, pretty neat. So let's try to work with this schema. Uh, So if I just want to get descriptions out of this, I have to look for uh, map entries. And I only want to, I don't care about map entries that have a key that is description. Okay, so once I have this, it's sort of up to what you want in order to, to do something with it. We can print out the form, but it may be better to do something more productive like uh, assign the form to a data structure or something. And I'll show an example of that. So right now I'm just printing it out. I'm just printing out the value of the, dis of the description. And it'll be printed out or it should be printed out in the console, which is here. So there we go. We have 200 CC lines of documentation printed out. Uh, 
not too great. However, it's not too difficult to also print out what the documentation is attached to. Uh, and actually using something like closure match would be a lot easier to, to, to figure out if my child has description and also print out my, my key. Uh, well, we can, we can try to do that here. So I want to match a map entry for the child, which is the vowel, is also a map entry. And where the child, the child is description, not the not the parent. So at this at this stage, I'm now dealing with the parent, where the child has a description. Uh, so the key of the parent should be something like query string. And the, the vowel would be this whole object. So we can also do like, We can do uh, get on the description of the child. Well, not really the child, but so this. So now I just changed the code a little bit, but now I'm matching one level up, and uh, this looks like a mess. But if you're using a pattern matching li pattern matching matching library. Instead of having this messy con stuff, you can just like write your condition statement as if it looks exactly like the maps or like destructuring. And this doesn't work. Okay, so the form is the map, the vowel of the form is the map. the key of the vowel of the form. Maybe I should just have child. We can also debug. So what is the form in this case? Just schema. We can just get to a point where, here we go. So this is where I want to, Actually, I want to match on the parent of this map entry valve form. So I'm already too far. Yeah, I need to quit. App entry. Ah, uh, uh, it's not a map entry that I want, it's a map.
Hey, that's progress. By the way, that is like perfect demonstration of what we are hoping to have in this group. This kind of exploration where we see debugging or something that we might be confused about. So thank you for this. And then we have time. And yeah, that is just perfect, a perfect way to begin, I think. And yeah, and it is great to see the, the, the little details. Yeah, uh, debugging walks can be, can be pretty complicated. Uh, but I've, uh, so on, on my crashed hard drive, I, I made a walk on the schema that would then generate a, a Mali schema. And then I also made a walk on the schema that pulled out, uh, not on the schema, sorry, on, uh, I have a folder of example um, payloads. And I made a walk that walked over those example payloads and assembled the, the data from those payloads into something that I made generators out of. So my Mali schema also was able to make uh, its, all, its examples, I guess, if you guys know what generators are, it made it made a fake data that was based off of the, the example payloads that I had. So it's sort of neat. Uh, and like with the help, so doing uh, walks like this is a bit annoying, but with something like closure match, it, it becomes a lot easier because then you're just essentially copy and pasting the thing you're matching on as opposed to writing out like, uh, very low level code like this. Um, could we try to fix something in line 85? I think here, exactly here, we don't want the, the key of the val because val is a map in our case. So we want just, we just want val form to have a key, which is description, right? So yeah, so that sounds like this. Yes. Thanks. Well, did that print out anything? <laughs> it did something. Yeah. It uh there's still a problem. It's still, it's printing out stuff, which I don't think. Oh, oh, this is actually a problem. Yeah, 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 this is a problem. I, I can't just be doing this. I have to do, so I'm not transforming the map, but what I, the code I wrote transforms the map. So when you're trying to not transform the map, like in here, we're just doing um, side effects. You have to always return the form. So there we go. And there we go. So now we have a list of the key to its documentation. So that's a, that's a lot more useful. And, but it's not really useful if we want to keep it. So I'll show you like a very quick way to do accumulators uh, using a walk. Because walking, it's very, very difficult to make a walk function where you're transforming uh, something into like you're transforming like a really nested data structure into a single map or an array. Uh, it's possible, but you have to like, you have to do a lot of work. So one easy way is to use a volatile. And uh, 
And when I when we get the thing we care about, we swap the volatile, which is. Could you mention what a volatile is? A volatile is a fast atom. It's a thread. It's not a thread safe atom. So you can't like this thing is happening within the same thread. So it's okay. Like if you had, um, if you want to distribute this workload or something, you couldn't use a volatile. Volatiles are used with uh, reducers. So I V swap back and I can conge it. So now I'm just adding uh, all the key values I care about to this to this accumulator. When I'm finished the walk, I can return the accumulator. I guess it's volatile. And then I should get a list of key value pairs. There we go. Oh my God, it's so slow, but that's it's slow because um this print function. Get val, get key. Let me just put them both in. Get rid of print. Printing is always really slow in enclosure. There we go. So now I have, a, I'm not printing out anything anymore. I'm now getting a list of key value pairs, the key of the schema, which is arbitrarily nested and then it's documentation right beside it. So something that we can use, something that's a, a lot more valuable than just printing out stuff to the console. So that is an example of some data processing that we do where somehow we find it easier to actually use data mutation, right? And, and kind of ex escape the functional approach for a moment and do it differently. Yeah, it's one of the nice things about closure. You don't always have to figure out how to do things with functional programming, which when you're dealing with trees and graphs, that's sort of where functional programming hits uh hits a wall becomes very very difficult to do certain things uh, with functional programming but still it is kind of safe uh, because it in just it is just in the local scope of the let it is just a small situation so we can feel okay about it probably right uh yeah uh, i'm sure some people don't feel okay about this but yeah, I'm I, one of them, <laughs> but I'm mostly just curious what happens since that volatile probably is the same API if you just make it a vector and conj onto the vector. It's just slower, right? Uh, uh, okay, let's, I'm, well, we're, we're not conjing onto a vector in this case. You can't do it. Uh, uh, v, v swap is swapping. a mutation thing. So an equivalent mm. would be like an atom or something. But I think what you may be thinking of is uh, just mutating the tree. So we could try just mutating the tree and see. Well, you have a let, you're let binding to that accumulator. So that's outside of your tree, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but now I'm not using it anymore. So mm -hmm. we, we can see what, what happens when we don't have this hack. To, yeah, and I, to, I apologize. To it's not, it, this isn't where you were going with it. I was just curious oh like i'm already done it's actually seeing what the what happens when you just mutate the tree is interesting and mutating the tree is one of the more valuable things you get from tree walking uh so this is what it looks like when i just mutate the tree so we still um we're getting some stuff we don't want um, but we are we are getting most of what we want. So Could we zoom in just a bit. Yeah. 
Thanks. So, uh, with the with the hack, we eliminated stuff like this, mm -hmm. right? So now we have like tag entry and and for like there's no description beside it. So something happened to that. I'm not really sure what. Um, but this is one of the the issues we run into. So sometimes mutating the tree to get what you want is pretty trivial. Uh, but sometimes you have to add extra conditions in order to make it so that the thing you get back looks like what you want it to look like. Mm -hmm. So um, when I when I made my tree walker for generating example data for making example data for my data generators uh one of the things i so i only mutated the tree i didn't do any hacky volatile stuff so one of the things i wanted to do was make uh, make it so that uh all all the nested lists in my tree, I want to push all the way to the leaves. Mm -hmm. That was my goal. So the, this, the, um, the data that I was given had like uh, a, a root key and that root key had a list. And in that list, there was a bunch of objects and some of those objects had lists for their values. Some of the keys had lists and it sort of just went on and on. And uh, I didn't really want to analyze that data, but I wanted to um, I wanted to make it so that I didn't have to do I didn't have to know if I was uh, accessing a list or not when when dealing with my data. And for my data generators, like uh, I just want to. I just want to give them a list of all the possible values some some key could take on. Mm -hmm. And I didn't care if the key was part of an array or part or part of a list or or whatnot. So I made a a walker where when it found a list, it would it would transform it. So it wasn't a list anymore. It was it was a map. Um and I can actually show that off. I I did it a bit sophisticated because I was doing like a recursive merge, but in here, in this schema, we do have a a structure like that where we have like lists here, a list, and then, uh, if you want to associate in this list, it's a bit nasty. So I can um and s some other helper functions and libraries I. I use they really don't like it when there's like map lists and maps and stuff. So I'll do a really quick, uh, really quick go where if we have a map, then uh, I do map indexed uh, map index vector is a, a bit of an idiom. It just makes it so that uh, you're actually, I'll just, I'll just show you uh, into this. So what these two lines of code do is they take a map, uh, sorry, they take a vector, they turn it into a map where each key is the position in that vector. So now instead of a vector, I have a map, and that map uh, has keys that are like one, two, three, or zero, one, two, three. So I can show you what this looks like. And I did it wrong because I actually want to look up vectors, not maps. And this is short circuiting. Uh, probably because I'm getting map entries. Yeah, so I, 
I also have to check that is not a map entry. There we go. So this is where like map entry sort of map entry vector similarity becomes a bit annoying. But there, so my schema used to have vectors in it and now it doesn't have vectors in it. But it's very easy for me to detect when I'm dealing with a, a map that I turn into a vector because I can check if the keys are integers. So I can sort of easily go back and forth from these representations. Uh, to go from a map back to a vector is a little, takes a little bit more work because I just need to, to do another check on it to see if all the keys are, are ints. But this is, this is one scenario that I find very useful uh, because, well, because I use another, I use a library made by Prismatic, where they have a function that takes a map and actually uh, flattens the map. But it can't flatten a map if it has vectors in it. So if I do this, if I flatten this map, it will uh, it will flatten it and uh, it will generate something that looks like, uh, like this, like zero type. Uh, release description and, and so on and then it'll so it'll give me a map of stuff like this where it'll have like the final value as the key so it turn it, it's a function that just turns a arbitrarily nested map into uh, a map with with key sex which you can give to a soch or Solshin or get in, and then the the value. Uh, the the library is called the uh, plumbing. It has some pretty useful functions in it. I think it's prismatic. If you look for prismatic plumbing on on Google, it would be the first hit. Very very small library, but has a lot of useful functions. Um, so that this is this is really useful. Another another thing that may be useful is finding all the nils. Sometimes nils are really annoying to deal with, or sometimes uh, you really don't care about certain things in your map, and you just want to get rid of them. So, like maybe I don't care about default nil, and I just want to make a smaller map that doesn't have these default nils. Another thing that I found useful, like this is too big, right? We're just dealing with too much data. So we can really quickly um, we can really quickly just write a write a function that uh, I don't want to do subs. Is there like some safe? version of subs string uh, uh, by the way paul that is fantastic uh, let oh, us yeah. maybe um slowly conclude this part there is time but maybe we'll keep uh, a little more time for other stuff so uh, oh yeah, yeah. sorry <laughs> so uh, so what yeah. i was going to do was i was i was just going to write a function that uh shortened the strings so it it would output the same map but it would be a lot smaller. And so one, one helper function I have is if I have, I detect if a list is very long and then I just shorten it to like five elements and I detect if a string is very long and I shorten it to like a hundred characters. And one thing that does is it, is it takes some really big data structure and it turns into a very small data structure that but uh, it will be like one tenth the size. So it'd be easier to get a high level overview of the data structure without actually uh, spending much time on it. Anyway, I guess like people should just ask questions. <laughs> 
if there are any. Oh, I, um, I'm wondering, uh, have you, uh, um, so is it walk is a little bit better than the uh, zipper functions? So zippers are useful for when you know what you want to do with your map, when you okay. know the structure. Because with zippers, you have an up, down, left, right. And zippers, uh, they'll keep an efficient representation of your, your traversal. So they remember what you did. Right. They remember where they remember how you got to where you are. So you can reverse right. what you did. Uh, so if you know exactly what you want to do in the shape of your map or the shape of your tree, they're they're useful for that. Walking is when you don't really know the shape of your tree. See. Like uh, or you you know a bit about it, but there's parts of it where you just don't you don't care like the like i i showed up in a one note that was really nasty which is a query string so here like this node that's sort of not nice to walk another another thing that walking or sorry it's not nice to like do a zipper over this it's also not nice to walk over this but one thing um walking does really well is like if you if you have a lot of self-similarity in your map but you don't know the structure then walking will let you write a little bit of code to find the things you care about and change them into something that would be easier for a zipper to use so if you really want to use a zipper on something, uh, but the thing you want to use it on is like a disaster, you could do walking to fix up your mess. And then you would have a much better experience doing a zipper over it, uh, which is what I actually did with this when I turned it into a Mali schema. Uh, Mali schema is a lot easier to deal with than JSON schema. So I spent a a little bit of time writing a walk that transformed this thing into something that is very easy for me to deal with. And then I just spent the rest of my time um, focused on the thing that's easier to deal with. I'm just curious, how do you, I mean, when you transform this thing into a schema, um, they have, well, for example, the description thing is is straightforward, but the, when you have nested the uh, you know map of map, and then do you just it's just generate a raw schema, right? Based on whatever, however the data is, and then you do is that how how you, how it goes? Uh, I have to I have to interpret what this means. So like, there's some weird things about JSON schema, like any of. <laughs> Which essentially just which essentially means a map, and items means array. So it's like there's like weird stuff. Weird, like JSON schema is a very strange format. Um, so one thing I do is well, I use a first of all, I use a pattern matcher. So uh, what I can what I can do with a pattern matcher is I can do something like this and then uh so like i can just do that i can be as lazy as i want a pattern matcher will actually match on this so when it sees this in the walk it will then run the transformation function but uh my pattern matchers actually uh they they look like this they're not they're not that lazy so they'll do this like any of and then i'll have a uh, match object something like that um actually this is oh i, I screwed up the <laughs> uh I screwed up the the brackets in this, but 
essentially looks like this. Any of items match object form and I will have a few of these because uh, like there's different styles of this any of. So I'll have like a, a few different patterns for any of and they'll look a little bit different. Um, like here, this thing, like max items. So this is a, this is what a tuple looks like. So I can actually do like tuple, like do tuple and then uh, string, string. And that, that would be, that would transform anything that looks like this anywhere in this tree into the, the appropriate schema. And that's a data, that's a data transformation. So this, the object thing, this any of thing is just a weird thing in JSON schema. And it, it, made, it makes it so trying to figure out how to transform an object in JSON schema is a bit, uh, it's not as easy as transforming like something like this. Like this transforms a string. So what I can, what I can do here is be like anywhere in my schema that sees this in Mali, it's maybe string and that's it. So now um, as I'm walking the object, as in like the, before this gets matched and we, we, ma we do our object transformation, this, the form already has this maybe string transformation applied to it. So my transformation functions are like cascading transformations. So the transformation functions that deal with the higher level ideas already have the lower level transformations applied. And I just need to consider that when I'm doing the transformations. So, uh, the, the code ends up being like for this whole schema transformation, uh, there were like 20 pattern matches that I had to make. Okay. And they were all about this long, just like uh, one line to one line, one, one pattern to one line of output. The object one was a little bit more complicated because I had to do something. I had to make a schema that was beyond what Mali uh, defaults allowed, but it was just like three lines of code. So in total, my my whole transformation was like 30 lines of code. And it just looked like this. So it didn't it didn't look like this. It didn't look like cond string map entry or anything. It just looked like this. It looked like uh destructuring. Oh, cool. Awesome. By the way, we have 12 minutes to the official time. And so maybe in a moment, it would be good to transition to a few other topics. And then uh, at least maybe a few of us could stay longer afterwards and, and chat further about walking. Uh, uh, Paul, any concluding remarks? Uh, the I don't know, it's just, it's just a, a tool. I found it really useful. I've been using walking since I discovered it very, very long time ago. Uh, and combined with pattern matching, like what I'm showing here, with, and pattern matching is like closure dot, I think it's core dot match, something like that. I don't think it's a standard library. I may be wrong. Uh, you get you get a lot out of it for a very little bit of code. I have a bias for declarative style programming though. <laughs> so 
I don't know, like, I think it's good to try out. It tends to be good for solving really nasty problems where like, otherwise you'd be, you'd be writing a lot of code to, to, to deal with your ugly data. And it's good for just, uh, this, it's good for turning unwieldy data into something that's a bit more manageable. Even if all you're doing is cutting it up and making, trying to make it fit on the screen. I feel like uh, it's very good for parsing uh, HTML, right? Yes, I use or this to do, on the web. I do use this for web scraping. Yeah. Uh, and one of the benefits with, uh, with uh, Closure Match is like, when you, when you fail to match something, It'll, it'll print out a huge debug message with the actual structure that failed. So you can copy and paste that. <laughs> and then um, you, sort of, you sort of get the Haskell experience of writing code <laughs> where the compiler tells you exactly what, what to write. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, Paul, thank you so much. To me, this session has been so useful you know i've learned really a lot well many details that i didn't know about and and you know you were doing it without your usual environment without your usual usual emacs so that is like amazing just to be able to do that and and may, maybe we should comment that this session is uh, that something that paul kindly agreed to do following our discussion of the coming closure data science course, because we were wondering about uh, this coming course of how we could teach those parts which are special about closure compared to other data science platforms. And those parts are in particular, this uh, joy of working with nested data structures, which is something that is arguably missing in other platforms and and yeah i guess we keep discussing that and that was like like to me a perfect demonstration of this topic and uh, i think what we could do now in the little time we have we could overview a few of the other groups uh, our plans in general in the coming weeks of uh, the different groups we're organizing and then maybe you would have some uh, feedback about it and uh, some thoughts about where we should go. Uh, any comments before we move to the next topic? Um, yeah, thanks. So maybe I'll share the screen and, and we'll, we'll go about it uh, for a moment. Um, so, so, So I think you see my browser now, and that is the Cyclodge website where you have some information about uh, the different community projects and such. And one of the things you have here is the dev and study groups page where you have the different groups we are running. And maybe we could discuss a few of them because a few of them are actually new and we wish to think for about our plans for them. So let us talk about these four groups. The visual tools groups, group has been running for a few months. Uh, it will meet again next week. It is a place for collaborating on building closure tooling for data visualization and literate programming and such, and UI and all that. And it, it is, has been like a model for us for how we could create a space for developers to collaborate and for people who wish to contribute to join the discussion. And then the data recur group, which is having a first meeting just today, this meeting, data recur group is trying to, to bring that to data related libraries, uh, libraries for data processing, data analytics, statistics, machine learning and such. And the hope is that we'll have sessions like today, but it will also be about what we wish to build. And it will be a space where people can share their experiments, their 
beginnings of things, their troubles and problems, they could help each other and find collaborations around building libraries and tools for working with data in closure. So to our listeners, if anybody has anything to share or wishes to become a contributor, then let us talk and see how this group could be useful for you. And then uh, maybe if we have time, uh, we'll discuss now in a moment what we actually want this group to become and what would be useful to us. And then two other groups that will begin soon are the data science course for closure developers, where we're actually going about teaching data science to closure developers and also to some data scientists who are curious about closure and wish to see how to do data science in closure. And there is a current very tentative wish list of what it could be in a certain outline that is still emerging of how it could go. And this will be discussed mostly offline in the Zulip chat in the coming uh, couple of weeks. And if anybody is interested in that, then let us talk and see how to make it useful for you. And if you have any comments about what you think it, it should be. And, and then maybe another group uh, worth mentioning is the joint probe group. It is special in that it is not a closure group. It is a group where we learn about uh, this field called Bayesian statistics and, and probabilistic modeling in general. And we learn that together with people of other community. And, um, and a few of the friends here are involved there. And maybe uh, any of you would like to comment about it and add some, some thoughts about that. And, and the idea of this joint probe group is exactly that exactly to mix with other communities to learn together to be kind of mutually curious and and all of that is going to begin very soon like uh, in in the coming few weeks and uh, yeah so that's like a short overview of the coming groups and and uh, we can see we are going through changes and uh, maybe in the little time we have we could discuss that and discuss what we wish to happen and so uh, any, any thoughts or comments about all that? Um, so I think that's very good. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I got noise in the background. Um, I definitely, since I'm still new to closure and definitely to data science, I definitely want to join the course. So I, I know that there are already people looking at R for data science as a book as a reference to start. So I'm going to, I definitely, went to the website and had that available for us it's free uh and then of course data recur because we're here um, um statistic groups completely intimidates me I feel like i gotta go back to college and learn math first but uh it's exciting to see that the, all these groups do exist uh it's just sometimes i hope that we're not trying to do too much all at once but uh, it's exciting to see the diversity of the groups Thank you. Yeah. Um, any any thoughts about that? Maybe uh, if if we have a little time, maybe we could use that time to mainly discuss how this group could go. What would make it useful? So, for example, we have this concept of bringing short updates of libraries and tools under development next month in a different hour. Uh, because of some time constraints, we'll have an update about the Clojask library. I'll share the screen for a moment. Uh, probably you see my browser. Clojask is a library for working with big table data. It is um, uh, recently it got a little more attention and, and it has been kind of it has become more visible by the authors and they will kindly update about it briefly in the coming month and maybe we'll kind of try to turn the next month meeting into a meeting about this kind of topic working with tables working with big data we'll see how to make it maybe into a theme for that meeting 
Mm -hmm. and, and so that's an example, right? And the idea is that we could have those short or a bit longer updates and then the discussion around them. And hopefully we could make those connections where somebody can see how they contribute. Um, so any ideas about topic you would like to see here about what would make it useful for you? Um, for this particular group, I think I probably just misunderstood what it was for, but I think it's important to have a recurring thing to sort of stitch things together. So I'm, I'm glad I'm here. Um, for me, the, the workflow conversations are always very useful to see the sort of the whole workflow from messy data and cleaning through some sort of model. I'm quite new to the modeling part. Most of my work is very simple. Um, adding things together and sort of cleaning and reporting. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see the course. For me in particular, I wouldn't be able to attend many things synchronously. So I, I'm happy to see the, the website. Um, so I'll, I'll be following along. And then I do need to leave. So I'm just selfishly saying what I'm interested in. Um, I'm, but the, it's so helpful. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so the the two things that I tend to work on are um, getting things into a database. So I'm um, trying to deal with Airflow and building a simple binary that can run using Airflow. I don't know if that's um, anybody else's need. Um, and then I'm also curious about graph, very large graphs, so millions of connections and using Bayesian statistics to group things together uh, with those connections. I think there's sort of a limit right now, or I haven't found um, something that's quite uh, fast enough to run on small, like four, four gigabytes of RAM um, to analyze that graph very quickly. I think we have really nice tools with UberGraph and um, Loom, but I'm curious how those mesh with something really fast like uh, Dataset, because uh, as I started using Dataset, the speed really changed how I work, and that was impressive for me. So thank you for everything you do. I'm very impressed by all your APIs, Daniel, and Tablecloth is changing my daily work. So I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for this meeting. Mm, thank you so much. So maybe I know you need to leave, but maybe let us just say that all the things you mentioned could be topics for a meeting, I think. Some of them might be a bit difficult to kind of capture in one hour or so, but, but let us try. So maybe if you wish, let us chat about it and find yeah, the timing. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, let us chat anyway, uh, offline and see. Uh, Wonderful. Where, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. nice to meet everyone. Thank you so much. See you. Yeah. So um, maybe any comments before we conclude the official part and stop the recording? Um, I'm wondering uh, if, uh, well, I mean, all this session going to be recorded, right? Yeah. Yeah. This session is recorded and will be public and we could edit out anything you would like to edit out. Yeah, but I'm just wondering if there is possible to push the session to Saturday, to weekend. Mm, you mean uh, Saturday, Sunday? Saturday or Sunday, yeah. Yeah. Because um, uh, I think uh, it'll be better for me. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so, I, you know, Friday afternoon, I don't usually able to find time and, uh, and I, you know, personally, I do prefer to sit, you know, join the live session and have some discussion if possible. You know. um, yeah, that just, yeah, that, yeah, let us try. Uh, just I think, a, I mean, if you can do it, that's fine. With, well, I just watch the recordings. But yeah, yeah. Uh, by our experience, some people uh, could prefer Saturday, some could prefer Fridays, and there is this conflict, and we try to diversify and and so probably sometimes we could make it uh, on week uh, on your weekends next week it will be friday because there is a special uh, talk that is already set up uh, okay. next month i meant but uh, yeah but uh, that helps to know things um, yeah 
Um, yeah, so maybe I'll say goodbye to the recording and then a few of us could stay longer and chat just a little bit more. Uh, so thank you so much for this session.